Can you imagine the force of the sea to have chopped the fluke of that anchor off when the ship was thrown up on the reef? In fact, the day that this ship did go on the reef was the beginning of one of the most bloodthirsty chapters in Australia's maritime history. Surviving the shipwreck was one thing, but the unlucky castaways from the Charles Eaton then had to run the gauntlet through the headhunters as they headed north trying to get to safety. In fact, it was then called the Straits of Terror. And only two children survived uh, the shipwreck because all the rest were massacred by the headhunters as they went through these Straits of Terror. And the heads ended up adorning a ceremonial mask. The horrible fate of the Charles Eaton crew was typical of an era of bloodshed and hardship for any survivors when their ships became tombs in the coral. the mast of the Charles Eaton boldly steered towards Great Detached Reef. The reef suddenly loomed up. Two anchors were let go, but they found no bottom, and she fell broadside onto the reef. When I discovered her remains, she was easy to identify by the cargo of 400 pig lead strewn over the coral floor. Rick Burnup and I are salvaging this one for my shipwreck museum. When the Charles Eaton hit the reef here, they, there was only one lifeboat survived and several of the crew jumped in this lifeboat and just simply disappeared. And that put the rest of the castaways in a very awkward situation. But the ship held together long enough for them to build two rafts. And then they drifted north from here, past the Charles Hardy Island, and as they were passing a beautiful little island called Boydong Cay, some natives in the canoe paddled out, about 10 or 12 warriors. And they looked fierce, but they seemed to be very friendly and they beckoned the survivors in to the beach. Well, the survivors were so exhausted they just collapsed on the beach, believing the natives were friendly. But that's when the mood changed. Out came the clubs, the sharp bamboo knives, and the warriors rushed in, belted all the castaways on the head, and the whole beach was just running red with blood and the bodies washing in the surf merely becoming bait for the sharks. But only four survived and they were four children and this was only because the, the women rushed down and grabbed and protected these four blonde children uh, from their warriors. That night the cannibals danced and chanted around the fire while the decapitated bodies were washing back and forth in the surf and the sharks were attacking them. Now, Boydon Island is such a beautiful place, and it's hard to imagine that such a horror took place here. The natives then moved on, going from island to island, taking the boys with them. But two of the boys later died. They were probably murdered and eaten. 
But Cabin Boy Island and little William O'Doyle, they were very well treated. Orid Island is another beautiful island in this Torres Strait area. And this is where all the trophy heads were taken. And they were used to create a grisly ceremonial mask of 45 skulls surrounding a turtle shell figure. Then the two boys were sold to a Murray Islander for a mere two bunches of bananas. And they stayed on Murray Island until their rescue about two years later. In fact, little William O'Doyle, who was only four years old, cried when he was taken from his cannibal foster father. The rescue ship Isabel sped over to Allred Island to collect all the skulls, and they're so horrified by what the headhunters had done that they destroyed everything on the island. Not just burnt down all the huts, but cut down every coconut tree. And so the headhunters had to leave Allred, and it took many, many years for the island to forget the horror and to slowly transform itself back into a beautiful island as we see today. Murray Islander Sam Passy remembers the story of the two boys. Uh, grandfather said, I think they pushed the um, guardian or father or the adopted father, pushed him overboard, and uh, the boys were crying, and one of them said, Baba, Baba, Kara Baba, Father, Father, my father. <laughs> and, uh, well, they didn't know anything about English. They forgot all about it. And they were just like you know, local islanders. I'm raising the Charles Eaton Cannon and taking it back to my museum for conservation treatment. The terrible saga of the Charles Eaton was the beginning of an era when the white man came in mortal conflict with the headhunters. The seemingly idyllic islands of the Torres Strait became islands of angry ghosts. Retribution followed each massacre and the trophy heads piled higher. Castaways were not the only targets. The headhunters travelled wide in their war canoes and raided Papuan villages to the north. The headhunters were cannibals only in the sense that they sometimes ate the eyes and cheeks of the victims and forced their children to do the same in order to make them brave. This actually happened to some of the Charles Eaton victims, to William O'Doyle's mother and the two boys I mentioned were killed. Magic and witchcraft played an important role in the daily lives of these islanders. They believed that they could enter existing animals and possess them without abandoning their human form. A native could become a dugong or a turtle. On Murray Island, the ceremonial mask and the famous drum of myrrh were dramatic symbols of great power. In those days, I would have been a person who would give order to kill that person or, or let this person go. Uh, because in those days, they used to give orders, kill and kill. And once they kill, now they kill husband, wife, children, dog, pigs and everything. I seek out the Spanish galleon legend. That's coming up next on Tombs in the Coral. While we credit William Jans with the discovery of Australia in 1606, many historians believe that both the Portuguese and the Spanish explored our east coast as far back as 1522. With the finding of a bronze cannon marked Santa Barbara 1596, and numerous Spanish coins, it's no wonder that some shipwrecks became Spanish galleon legends. I'm checking this wreck at Stevens Island 
because she is supposed to be a Spanish galleon. Well, I've just gone and put another Spanish galleon to rest. That's a nice lamp, but certainly not old enough to be Spanish. I think the wreck would be the Ellsworth. She sunk in 1880. But when she went down, she did cause quite a good Spanish galleon legend. You see, the captain's wife, when she saw the ship was doomed, put on all her precious jewellery. But the castaways, when they stepped ashore, they were all killed by the headhunters. Only the woman was spared. And they took this jewellery from her and put it around their own Zogo idol. And part of the jewellery was two big ruby eyes. And these were placed on the Zogo. And from then on, they called it Fire Eyes. The natives celebrated and danced themselves into a frenzy to the beat of their war drums. The poor woman took this opportunity to quietly slip away, but she was never seen again. Perhaps she threw herself into the ocean rather than end up like her beheaded husband. Now when the missionaries came, they destroyed these stone idols, but the headhunters buried their precious Zogo with all its jewellery. In 1934, a trochus fisherman named Bruce accidentally uncovered the idol on the beach here at Stevens Island. And he also found those two big ruby eyes. So therefore the legend is true, but the Spanish galleon part of it, no. It's every diver's dream to find a treasure ship. And after 38 years of diving, I'm still hopeful. I scratch around in every wreck I find. There are still many fabulous treasure ships still to be found in Australia. And I guess the, the greatest of all would be the Madagascar. Now, she left Melbourne in 1853 with a cargo of 63,000 ounces of gold, nine chests of gold sovereigns, and eight chests of silver. An incredible fortune, and she was never seen again. That fortune is now worth a cool $40 million. It shall remain a mystery until a chance discovery on some forgotten reef. Over on the west coast, there are three missing Dutch treasure galleons, and that would be a really exciting find for any diver who stumbles across one of these. I've looked for them, quite a lot of people have looked for them, because they were carrying an unbelievable fortune of eight to 10 treasure chests each, and all were full of gold and silver coins. But the lucky finder will be a short-lived millionaire because the government will take the lot. It's sad, but finders are not always keepers with our law of the sea, and especially where treasure is involved. The equipment I'm carrying is a magnetometer, the latest device in wreck hunting. It's my little toy. Help us find a bit, do you think? Yeah, well I've tested it out, it's very good at picking up any bit of rubbish around the place. It's working all right. We're searching for a very old ship, the Morning Star. She sunk in 1814, northeast of Portland Roads. She's been declared an historic shipwreck, but as yet no one has found her. Her eight iron cannon should give us a good reading if we pass close to her. Iron objects will cause localised variations in the Earth's magnetic field and this proton magnetometer will measure these anomalies. It will signal us by the fluctuation of the meter and an alarm. This is where the morning star should be, Lenny. About two and a half miles from uh, Point Island. And obviously the ship must have hit one of those. All we can do now is, is set a, a grid pattern on those two boys you threw over and just go up and down until we get a reading. Hopefully. Okay, that's a 50, Ben. Good. Almost up the scale. That's yeah, still off. I'll still do another circle, try and pinpoint it. Looks very promising, doesn't it? On the sound as well as the magnetometer. It's got to be something. Yeah. Ready? Yeah. I knew at first sight this was not the morning star. 
I can recognise the fittings belonging to a junk, a Taiwanese clam poacher. thing about a shipwreck is the multitude of fish that gather around it. And when we want dinner, they jump on the hook. It's been a long battle, but Denise Carlson is finally landing her first fish. Now that's not fair, Rick. We locate a mystery wreck next on Tombs in the Coral. I've located many shipwrecks by simply scanning the reef at low tide with Polaroid sunglasses and binoculars. We can discern any unusual dark shapes and straight lines. Well, if they ran down this channel and then bore away, there's Bird Island up there. Right. They bore away a bit earlier and clobbered the reef on this corner. Yeah. Yeah, that's possible. Well, possibly what, just in here somewhere. Yeah. But... Well, what if we, there's a, there's a shallow point up here that is still a feasible one that they could have yeah. hit. What if we drop a boy there? and a boy down on, on, on the tail of the of cockworm down there sure. and we'll do a tow. I've got a special interest in this ship called the Anne. She lost a cargo of gold coins when she hit Cockburn Reef in 1853. The matter board is another simple search method. We can sweep a wide area with very little effort and look for wreckage hidden in the coral. And it's good for spotting other things too, like tonight's dinner. I just while I get this for you. Okay. Yeah, that's what does it look like? Oh, it's, it's very well buried. Uh -huh. There's a there's a lot of anchor chain running across, yeah. and there's like a big boiler here, and plates. There's a lot of square plates. That's what I first saw. It was like a square yeah. plate, and I brought it off, and then I come onto the yeah. anchor chain. Oh, well, I'm going to get in. Yeah, it's great. The rest in that? Yeah, what? Well, then hard to work out some of those items, though. What do you think those, uh, those big cauldron things are? No, well, at first I thought that might have been for boiling whale oil, but they're, they're not big enough and they're too heavy. They've got, uh, they've got big lifting lugs on the side, yeah. so they might be for uh, smelting, smelting yeah, pots. That's possible. Very, very thick. Yeah. Well, I worked out what the wheels were, you know, I thought they were wagon wheels at first, but they are, but they belong to a train wagon, you know, the, the hand trolley? Yeah, they could do. Because there's, a, there's an actual handle down there which is the same as the... Pushing the, up and down. Yeah. And, um, and also the, the big boilers, the two big boilers there. Yeah. I mean, they would belong to a train, not, not a big train, but what it appears we've got there is a puffing billy. Since there were nine ships lost on Cockburn, we're not sure if this is our treasure ship. In fact, it took a foraging giant ray to uncover some startling new evidence. 
the seabed is littered with ammunition. Have a look at these. What have you got? The bullets. Enough to start a war down there. Is there a bag there? Uh, I don't think so. My hat? Yeah, okay. Why don't you come in and have a look? We'll grab some, eh? Okay. You just start straight down here. Perhaps the ammunition was meant for the 1873 war in Sumatra, which was organised by the American pepper merchants against the Dutch. The bullets do date the wreck after 1870. So sadly, I know it can't be the gold ship. There's hundreds of them down there. I don't know, they're big. Probably 45, some of these. But these ones are much bigger, much bigger than 45. Yeah, this one's got a hole in it. Well, that's a dum-dum, dum-dum bullet. Some of them have got, uh, see this one's got the cartridge still there? That's a small one, it's probably a 38, that one. There must be six or seven hundred of them down there. Maybe they're being shipped over to America for your wild west. You never know. Later research proved that the ammunition was indeed 45 and 58 calibre. It's more likely the mystery ship was a blackbirder carrying firearms to trade for Kanaka labour. I brought the cannon I salvaged from the Charles Eaton back to my shipwreck museum in Port Douglas. It must undergo an extensive conservation treatment before it can go on display. Now it's starting to look like a cannon. And I think I'm looking a little bit more like I came out of a coal mine. It's hard work uh, to chip all this coral away. In fact, I've got a beautiful blister there. So next comes the long stage. I have to raise this cannon and put it into a large vat, fill it with water, and then put in the water a 2% solution of sodium hydroxide, that's uh, caustic soda. And it'll sit there for about eight months. And the uh, caustic soda will very slowly leach the chlorides of salt water out of the iron. Now these two anodes, these steel plates, are very important. Uh, they're on the plus side of this rectifier and the cathode is actually the cannon. Now this will create electrolysis action which will vastly speed up the extraction of the chlorides and will also uh, literally change the composition of the iron back to a magnetite which is a, a denser lower form. Now with this uh, rectifier I'll bring it up to uh, preferably about 10 or 12 amps. Now I know when it's, when it's about right because you'll see very fine bubbles emitted from the uh, uh, cannon bubbling up to the surface and then I know that the whole electrolysis system is working. I was running south in August when we came alongside two humpback whales of the Whitsunday group. This is their winter calving and mating area. My destination is Keswick Island off Mackay, where the wreck of the Singapore lies. She hit what is now called Singapore Rock in 1877. The currents really boil around this rock, and we can only dive her on slack water close to low tide. Uh, she's still running too fast, Rick. We'll have to wait a while. OK, I'll just finish pumping the tank. Every care must be taken on this dive especially our timing of the currents. It can appear to be calm, 
and a moment later be running at 6 knots. Really fast. Yeah. It's all right when we get down underneath though. Yeah, it should be like left behind the red. Have to be, really. <laughs> Gotta really watch where that chain is. Yeah. Don't get lost. Mm. Okay, the rank, mate. 25 on the top line. The Singapore was a 1,540 tonne steamship with a cargo of tea from Hong Kong. She just landed 450 Chinese at Cooktown for the gold rush and picked up a few lucky prospectors. Right on slack water, the visibility improves and now we can see lots of fish which were hidden from our view before. Timing is critical now. We have to return to the boat while it's still calm. The tide will turn soon and the current will come in a rush from the opposite direction. I think we've already stayed down too long. Just put it down there. You take the long off the bench. Oh, no! Well, I'll try to get your other arm out. Uh, Did you see Rick? No. He was behind me, walking on a floor pop. Alright, okay, we'll have to haul him in. Yeah. Hang on, Rick. You okay? Okay. You're in the back, Eddie, now. Where is it? Here. You all right? Got a good hold? I thought I was gone. What do you want? Give us a support hold. Yeah. Right on. Running about six knots now. Oh, it's more than that. Okay. Nope. Good looking port hole, Rick, but oh. where's the other half? <laughs> we find a warplane buried in the coral. That's coming up next on Tombs in the Coral. It was pleasant to get away from the wild inshore currents and big tides and dive the outer reef of Mackay. Now my kids, Adam and Dean, can practice their snorkeling in clear, safe waters. Lynn's invaded the damselfish's territory. It thinks it owns this part of the coral wall. The two cod are courting or perhaps they're whispering about the big moray eel coming up behind Lynn. Moray 
Grey eels are like cats. They smooch when there's food around. And they're not stupid. This one knows the fish is hidden in a pocket on Nins BC. Here's another kind of tomb in the coral. Very few people realise just how close World War II came to Australia. Many of our northern towns were raided and bombed. Denise is checking out a Vulcan Vengeance plane, an American submarine spotter which crashed on the reef in 1945. excellent record of coral growth. A metre of coral has grown over the wing in 43 years. I've seen more than a dozen of these warplanes wrecked along our coast. In 1943, a formation of 33 air cobras, including this one, flew out of Townsville on a sortie, heading for Port Moresby to engage the Japanese. Now, as they passed Cooktown, they ran into a violent storm and there was zero visibility, so they ended up breaking formation. And when they finally came out of the clouds, somewhere along Cape York, they found that they were lost. One by one, the plane started to run out of fuel. Engines spluttered and died, and the pilots desperately looked for a safe landing ground to ditch their planes. This one shows this beach at Cape Grenville. Luckily, it was low tide and the beach was very wide and safe, and all the crews survived. But 14 air cobras were ditched that day along the entire Cape York Peninsula area. And I think that day nature was a lot more violent than the Japanese guns. All shipwrecks and their cargo are owned by someone. This may be the original owner, the insurance company, a salvage company, or the Crown. With the Eastern Argosy relics, it's a little different. She ran the ground on Clack Reef in 1960 and jettisoned her cargo of crockery to lighten the ship to haul her off. They didn't bother to salvage the cargo. They simply threw it away. We know that remoras usually travel with sharks. The water's murky and Lynn hastens her collecting for the museum. an idea how much you know how fast the coral grows but 1960 and all that coral has grown on that teapot in that short time you got enough for plenty of tea parties now the cannon's been in this bath for six months and I'll take this sample of the water to a laboratory to test for chlorides and if there's no chlorides, or only just a very small amount, then I know that the cannon has been treated. But we still don't stop there. It'll go into two separate baths of distilled water before it's finished. Stanley Island is north of Cooktown and close to Bathurst Bay. The Aborigines once lived here, and they camped in the big caves that we're now approaching. Mm. 
In one of these caves, they painted the most tragic event in our early history. It was the grouping of many pearling vessels around the island just days before the most terrible of cyclones descended upon them. There's a crocodile there. Yeah, and what do you think this one is? Mm, maybe a jellyfish. Mm -hmm. That could be Captain Cook's ship. <laughs> well, this is primarily what we came up to see because this would be a mothership to, to all the luggers uh, that were caught in the great cyclone. And obviously the, the Aborigines have painted these ships. They've been lying in the harbour down there. And these would be schooners. You can see more here. There's another one here. Yeah, another, another one, one there. back there. Imagine this is possible that these were all, all lying at anchor just, just out here uh, when the great cyclone came in and wiped most of them out. This was about the centre of the great cyclone of 1899. Now on March 4, the whole of the, the Queensland Pearling Fleet were anchored here, 113 ships. And that day, it, there was just an ominous calm. In fact, the sky went black, absolutely black. Vivid lightning, and the barometer just plunged down to 27 inches, which we read as 914 millibars. Now, uh, Cyclone Tracy was 950 millibars, a lot weaker cyclone than that demolished Darwin. So you can imagine the, the terror through the night. Now, I've been through cyclones, lesser ones than this one, of course, and I can understand the, the terror that these sailors went through as these phenomenal seas just literally smashed their boats to pieces. The shrieking wind drowned out the cries of the sailors as they were swept overboard. And of the 113 ships, 73 were totally demolished by the next morning. In fact, some of them were actually swept half a mile inland because the tidal surge was 40 feet high. And this whole coastline and this island was just littered with bodies and wreckage. And in fact, uh, 307 people drowned and it was our worst maritime disaster. More cyclone disasters are coming up next on Tombs in the Coral. We're searching for a magnificent wreck called the Ongala. She was also a cyclone victim. Must be very close now, Ben. Well, it's coming up to 10.4, but not quite. 10.35. <laughs> These marks seem to be lining up pretty well. Yeah. Nothing on the sound, that's still very flat. That's lining up on these marks that, uh, on, your mark, on your map here. Uh -huh. The Ongala is out in the middle of the ocean some 10 miles off Cape Bowling Green. That's why she's so hard to locate, even though I have good landmarks. A pelagic fish on the troll line is the first sign that we're fairly close. It's useful as a search technique when I know that the hidden wreck is swarming with fish. Should be very close there, still nothing. You've got to pick it up and stay on this. Yeah. Very close now. Oh, there's something, Rick. Oh, that's it. Can I throw the boy over? Yeah, throw the boy. Okay. Current's got us off the wreck a little bit, Rick. Current's got us off. We're a little bit that side. Just, fine. just going off the sound of that, we went right over the top of it. Okay, fine. That's a better one. Yeah, oh, this this looks much better. You want me to get up? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Gadgets for deep diving. Mm. Right. Uh, 18, 18 past, 18 past two.
The dive is 27 metres to the sand, deep enough for us to worry about the bends. But the Yongala is worth it. She's the most magnificent wreck I've ever dived on. This sunken tomb has its own serpent, a mild-mannered sea snake with a bite as deadly as a taipan. The Ongala was the pride of the Adelaide Steamship Company. In 1911, she was caught in a severe cyclone and simply disappeared. She must have gone down very quickly as none of the 120 persons on board survived. Not one body floated ashore. They were all trapped inside the hull, deep down in her watery tomb. So she became a ghost ship, her whereabouts unknown until 1943 when a minesweeper fouled its equipment on her. Now she's my favourite wreck dive. The Australian government recently declared the Yongala an historic shipwreck. Now her relics are fully protected. We can look, but not take. Our first dive is limited to 30 minutes to avoid decompression. Gabby? Uh, 30 minutes, 80 feet. Right. About five minutes on the decompression for safety. Did you see that uh, lamp in that uh, in that hole I showed you? Square one. Well, obviously, no one has touched that lamp in what in the seven years since we first dived on this wreck. Still sitting in there. A lot of sea snakes, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. sea snakes are good. It's a little shovel nose shark. Yeah. Then I was down 80 feet and I had 30 minutes down there. Now that puts me in the group G. I've worked out that if I wait one hour 16 minutes from now, I'm into group E and that gives me 24 minutes at 70 feet. Now what have right, you got well, if for I go, If I go with you, that's my first dive. So I've got 40 minutes at 80. Okay, 40 at 80 mm. and 50 at 70 50 feet. 70. Right, well, I, well, let's keep around the 70 and that will give us sure. a lot more um, diving time. The marine life on the Yongala is stunning. The harmless leopard shark gives Lynn a gentle toe. Above hover giant stingrays. They measure three metres across. The loss of the Yongala had a profound effect on so many families. When I first filmed the Yongala 11 years ago, I received many emotional letters. One woman wrote that when she saw the ship's bell on film, it caused such an emotional upheaval she wept for several days. She was so overwhelmed with a sense of tragedy by an event that happened when she was only seven years old when she suddenly lost several of her family. We were heading home at the end of January when we ran into a severe tropical storm. The barometer was plunging. 
I was glad to make it back to Port Douglas because Tropical Cyclone Winifred was heading our way. Securite, all ships, a gale and strong wind warning for small craft between Cooktown and Gladstone, issued by the Bureau of Meteorology Brisbane at 11 a.m. this morning. At 11 a.m., severe tropical cyclone Winifred, 965 millibars, was located 70 nautical miles east of Cairns and 70 nautical miles northeast of... Winifred hit the coast just south of Cairns. Her 220 kilometre winds smashed a path of destruction through small communities. Those unfortunate to have been at sea will never forget the terrible wind and the phenomenal seas. Modern cyclone warnings did not save these ships. In the days of the Ongala, there were no warnings and so many lives were lost. As a memorial to all those lost in the Ongala, I reconstructed part of the ship in my museum, the way I first saw her in her watery tomb. It's looking pretty good now. This cannon has been sitting for the last 10 months in the special treatment bath, but uh, now all I've got to do is dry it out in the sun and give it a couple of coats of epoxy varnish. But the sea has treated this cannon pretty harshly whilst it's been on the reef. It's full of corroded pock marks, but it is fully preserved, and soon it will be on display in my shipwreck museum. Now, relics like this are a time capsule of our past, and that's why I find wreck hunting such a rewarding adventure. You see, these ships in the coral are really sunken museums, and the relics that we've salvaged, they do reveal a great deal about Australia's earliest history.